voyage of ancient times will come from the Dead Sea Scrolls. about the Dead Sea Scrolls, what do we think about? Do we think about them primarily as important witnesses to the Bible, as snapshots into the time and circumstances behind Jesus and the writing of the New Testament? Do we think about peculiar religious practices, the multivalent picture of early Judaism, secret codes, or windows into esoteric cultic rituals and thoughts that seem utterly foreign to us today? Chances are, if you have even a passing interest in Christianity or Judaism, then you have thought even just a little bit about the scrolls, and the way you think about them is probably owed in large part to where you come from. Preachers and apologists love to see the scrolls for how they can validate historical claims about the church, or as a vouchsafe on supposed inerrancy of scripture. Meanwhile, Sensationalists like Michael Bajent and his Priory of Scion or Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code turn to the scrolls for supposed documentary evidence to support their cockeyed conspiracies. In the middle is the scholar, and the truth about why we should care about these ancient manuscripts. And that is what this video series is about. This is an exploration of the Dead Sea Scrolls. From the history of their discovery, to their contents, to the people behind these texts, to their rather enormous effect on religious studies of early Judaism, Christianity, and the Bible. While these are teaching videos, they are also counter-apologetics tools to counter numerous exaggerations, half-truths, and outright false and agenda-driven claims about the scrolls. I've structured this series into 11 parts, and these correspond to a series of short videos from about two years ago by Matt Whitman of the 10 Minute Bible Hour. At the outset, I must confess that uh, while I no longer identify as a Christian, I really like the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and I think Matt does a really good job in these short videos of providing a pretty honest and accurate introduction to the scrolls. But there's only so much a guy can do in 10 minutes, and for me, a guy who has spent his lifetime reading, studying, working professionally, and writing about the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's just so much more that people need to know about this fascinating collection of literature. Every journey begins with that first single step. If you pop open a box of Apple Jacks, even one that says there's a free toy inside, Still, the biggest chunk of thing you're going to find in here is Apple Jacks themselves. Likewise, you pop open the Dead Sea Scrolls, the biggest chunk of stuff is just going to be Bible. But when I say Bible, I don't mean New Testament, even though chronologically this overlaps with the New Testament a little bit. The people who wrote this stuff down, it's not where their head was. They weren't Christians. They were part of an ancient Jewish sect that got referenced by a few different historians that lived back in the day. And their thing was that apparently they were into the exact same... Old Testament, the exact same Hebrew scriptures that we still have around today. The story of the Dead Sea Scrolls usually begins with the Bible. It is not because all or even most of the scrolls were biblical texts. They were not. Rather, this is because it appears that what we know as the Bible was on some level integral to the existence of the scrolls in the first place. But now the scrolls have become essential to our understanding of the Bible and the trajectory of biblical scholarship since their discovery. In this video series, I want to challenge some of the ways in which we think about this relationship and to show that our own preconceptions of what the Bible is has from the beginning deeply affected the ways in which scholars have researched and published the Dead Sea Scrolls, often on the basis of an anachronistic modern appraisal of the Bible. So we're going to get to all that, but for now we begin with the Bible. The discovery of the scrolls is a well-known tale, and it is something that we will reflect back upon throughout this series. But there are problems with how this story 
continues to be told. The story of the Bedouin shepherds from the Ta'amira tribe who found the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls has become part of collective imagination in Western culture. The story has become a classic discovery narrative in its many retellings replete with highly recognizable cultural tropes. The naive and unsophisticated Arabs, the accidental happenstance of discovery, and the remarkable good fortune of virtuous Western academics who rescued the scrolls from destruction or loss. The story of the discovery of the scrolls has really become a vehicle for promoting their significance for whomever is telling it. Whether that be scholars, apologists, the, the state of Israel, or even the Bedouin themselves who were mostly determined to profit from their sale. But it is important to note that we have reasons to be suspicious about the accuracy of the trade narrative at several points. In view of this, let us begin with what we have been told happened. As the story goes, at some point in late 1946 or early 1947, a young man, Muhammad Ahmed El Hamad, also known as Edib the Wolf, threw a rock into a cave in the cliffs on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea, where he was tending herds in the late afternoon near the ruins of Khirbat Qumran. He heard the shattering sound of broken pottery. Edib summoned his cousins with him, Juma Muhammad and Khalil Musa, to investigate. And then early the next morning, Edib entered the cave on his own and saw two intact jars among the broken remains of pottery, from which he removed three leather bundles. These were later identified as an intact scroll containing all of Isaiah, the partial remains of a commentary on Habakkuk, and the so-called Serik Hayachad, a community rule which contained teachings and dictates for governing a Jewish religious sect. Juma and Khalil were displeased by their younger companions' eagerness to scout the cave without them, and this probably played into their decision to cut him out from their efforts later to sell the scrolls that they had found. In the meantime, the three scrolls were stored in a bag, suspended from a tent pole, at the Bedouin camp on the outskirts of Bethlehem for weeks or months. We shall return to the Bedouin and this discovery later, but for now we're going to focus our attention on one of these first three manuscripts, possibly the most famous of all the Dead Sea Scrolls, the so-called Great Isaiah Scroll. It is kind of interesting that these three scrolls together in very broad strokes represent almost a microcosm of how scholars have organized the entire collection of what would come to be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is a copy of a known biblical text. There is a scroll that contains the biblical text along with extensive and detailed interpretation, and there is a scroll that is dedicated to the life and theology of the community that collected the scrolls. and potentially also wrote many of them. The Great Isaiah Scroll is so called because it is the largest intact biblical manuscript to survive from the Second Temple period. That is the roughly 585 year period of the Temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem that is traditionally thought to have stood from around 515 BCE until the final destruction of the completely renovated and expanded structure of Herod the Great in 70. CE. And while there is good reason to believe that the Jerusalem temple was probably not constructed so early, the late 6th century BCE is a sufficient starting point for our designation of the Second Temple period. At the time of the scroll's discovery, virtually everything known about the text of the Old Testament stemmed from Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts written no earlier than the 10th century and a smattering of earlier small fragments. Greek translations of the Old Testament published by the church starting in the 2nd century and a handful of older fragments, 1st or 2nd century BCE, of the Greek text of the Old Testament, otherwise known as the Septuagint. To put this into sharper perspective, 
Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, the oldest, arguably one of the most important biblical manuscripts, was this, the Nash Papyrus. This is a single papyrus sheet measuring 13 by 7 centimeters and contains a version of the Ten Commandments, blending text from Exodus 21 to 17 with Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 21, and the so-called Shema from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. This papyrus sheet was acquired by a biblical scholar from an antiquities dealer in Egypt in 1902, and it dates somewhere between the late 2nd century BCE and the 1st century CE. Suddenly, now within months of Ed Dibb's discovery, the first Western scholars to see the great Isaiah scroll, John C. Trevor, and my own Dr. Vodder's Dr. Vodder, would that make him my Dr. Grossvater? William S. Brownlee found themselves looking at an intact scroll, at least as old as the Nash papyrus, but over a hundred times the size. Trevor and Brownlee were postdoctoral students working at the American School for Oriental Research, otherwise known as ASOR, in East Jerusalem. When they received word in February 1948 from a Syrian Orthodox bishop, Mar Athanasius Samuel, about this ancient document that he had purchased from an intermediary between its Bedouin discoverers and himself, which he was unable to decipher. He was actually looking for help from their supervisor, the great Professor Miller R. Burroughs, who happened to be on an archaeological excavation in Iraq at the time, leaving the center in the care of the two postdoctors. Brownlee and Trevor were able to correctly identify the samples of text that they saw with Isaiah, and correctly dated the manuscript on the basis of pictures they had on hand of the Natch papyrus. Within weeks, Trevor, a budding amateur photographer, had managed to capture the entire scroll in vivid, newly invented Kodak color. The Great Isaiah Scroll itself contains every word of the 66 chapters of Isaiah, stretching over 17 finely prepared parchment sheets in 54 columns of around 30 lines and measuring a total of 7.34 meters, or 24 feet. The manuscript was clearly bifurcated in the center at the end of the 27th column between chapters 33 to 34 and was written and corrected by at least two scribes. Word of the discovery of the scroll spread and with it the sudden realization that this was going to fundamentally alter the landscape of biblical and Judaic studies. Immediately upon developing photographs of the manuscript, Trevor sent a sampling to the greatest living expert of Semitic languages, Johns Hopkins professor William F. Albright, with a request to please provide his own expert opinion about the date and authenticity of the text. On the 15th of March, 1948, Albright's response was received in Jerusalem. My heartiest congratulations on the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. There is no doubt in my mind that the script is more archaic than that of the Nash Papyrus. I should prefer a date around 100 BC. What an absolutely incredible find! And there can happily not be the slightest doubt in the world about the genuineness of the manuscript. Over the course of the next decade, tens of thousands of fragments were found belonging to about 900 individual manuscripts extracted from 11 caves in a one and a half kilometer radius. Significantly, all of the manuscripts were written over a roughly 350 year period between about 250 BCE to 100 CE. All were written in Hebrew and Aramaic with a handful in Greek and between 200 to 300 appear to be copies of texts known from our modern Bibles. You will notice as we continue through our exploration of these so-called biblical scrolls that my numbers for them are not precise and the reason for this is because there are varying opinions, not only on what counts as a biblical scroll, but also on how many of them there actually are what we would call Dead Sea Scrolls. For example, a few years back I gave a university talk in which I identified 220 manuscripts as biblical, 
on the basis of how scrolls from the 11 Qumran caves have been designated by scholars. In 2013, Peter Flint counted 318, including biblical manuscripts discovered in other sites in the Judean deserts, which date to around the same period, but then also dozens of manuscript fragments for sale on antiquities markets or in private collections, most of which have now been determined to be forgeries. Among these manuscripts, every book of the Jewish Hebrew Bible or the Protestant Old Testament was accounted for except for the Book of Esther. For most evangelical observers, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls generally, and the Great Isaiah Scroll in particular, has been a source of tremendously useful apologetic ammunition. In the imagination of most of them, the scrolls provide essential proof of the stability and reliability of the biblical text. For example, in the 2000 edition of Halley's Bible Handbook, we read the following. The oldest manuscripts we have, the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran, which date back to at least the first century AD, show essential agreement with minor variations with the Hebrew text we have today. Unless we find manuscripts from an even earlier date, which is not very likely, we must assume that the Hebrew text of the Old Testament is indeed an accurate copy of the original text. I recall reading the following as an undergraduate in a 1984 copy of Unger's Bible Handbook that I found in my in-law's basement. The first Isaiah scroll is amazingly similar to the standard Masoretic Hebrew text, the earliest extant manuscripts of which date almost a millennium later. This scroll constitutes one of the great manuscript discoveries of all time and authenticates the high accuracy of Hebrew textual tradition. More notable, contemporary apologists like Sean McDowell have said things like this. The most significant find by far is called the Great Isaiah Scroll. And this is in cave one. I've actually been there. I've actually climbed up the mountain, went into the cave and seen with my own eyes the place where they found this scroll. Not that we are comparing, but here is video footage of me actually inside the vault with the actual Great Isaiah Scroll, working on it with professors Eugene Ulrich from the University of Notre Dame and the University of Toronto, and Peter Flint from Trinity Western University. But good for Sean. And the reason it's important is this scroll dates to about 125 BC. That's about a century and a quarter before the time Jesus was born. Well, before this time, the earliest copy we had of Isaiah in its completion was 1008 AD. That means in one Fine. They just spanned over 1,100 years. So of course their first question was, wait a minute, we had this manuscript from before Christ? We have one a thousand years after that our Bibles have been based on. How do these two manuscripts match up? Has it been changed over this 1,100 plus years or is it the same? And do you know what they found? They were virtually identical. Now there were a few minor spelling grammatical mistakes because they had been copying this by hand for over a millennia. But the content was virtually identical, which shows the care and precision these Jewish scholars paid to copying the Word of God. And this gives us tremendous confidence that when we hold the Bible in our hand, in particular the Old Testament, we can realize that these scholars weren't freely changing things, they weren't carelessly just adapting things. The Jewish scribes who've copied the Old Testament by hand paid incredible precision and care to be sure that the Bible has been copied accurately. The Dead Sea Scrolls are one reason among many that we can trust the Old Testament the documents in our hands have not been changed. Returning to Matt Whitman in the 10 minute Bible hour, he goes on to say, not only is there a whole bunch of Old Testament in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it all looks a whole lot like the Bible that we were operating off of in the 1940s in terms of our oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament. And what's crazy about that is that our oldest manuscripts dated to like 1000, 1100 AD. And this bounces all the way back to at the earliest 250 BC. That's a crazy amount of time, and to have the scriptures line up as well as they do is kind of mind-boggling. So, in the first place, the reason the Dead Sea Scrolls were, at first, thought to be so significant, and the reason they have become so important for Christians and for Christian apologists, is because they are our earliest sources for the Bible, and among the hundreds of manuscripts and fragments of biblical texts, they seemed at the outset to validate the current form of the Old Testament scriptures. Something that Matt makes a point of here 
is that from what was discovered in the 11 Qumran caves, it appears that not only is there confirmation of the text of scripture, but also the shape of it. Multiple copies of several of the Old Testament books were found, and scholars have tended to use these numbers as an indicator of what the collectors of these scrolls were reading, what was most important to them, a uh, canon within the canon if you will. And the most popular of these scrolls are the books of Genesis, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Psalms. This is especially interesting because it also aligns with the most frequently quoted Old Testament texts in the New Testament. In addition to the great Isaiah scroll from Qumran Cave 1, there was another large copy of Isaiah found in the same cave, along with 17 more in Qumran Cave 4, and one more in each of Caves 3 and 5, for a total of 21 manuscripts. There was a total of 33 copies of texts from Genesis found in five of the Qumran caves, 29 copies of Deuteronomy in six caves, 32 copies of the book of Psalms discovered in six caves. Corresponding to these numbers, we can also see an agreement within the hundreds of scrolls that are thought to have been composed by members of the community, which mostly parallels this trend. Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Psalms were more frequently referred to or cited directly than most other biblical books in these documents. The conclusions from this tend to be drawn this way. First, the Hebrew scriptures by and large were of primary importance to this mid to late Second Temple Jewish group who collected them. Second, within these scriptures, the collectors were particularly fond of a smaller grouping of texts, and this group, third, also parallels the frequency of Hebrew scripture citations that appear in the Christian New Testament. The most frequently cited Old Testament books in the New Testament are Psalms, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, Exodus, and Genesis. Significantly, the books that were underrepresented in the Dead Sea Scrolls were also those that the New Testament authors did not bother to cite. No Kings, no Chronicles, no Ezra, no Nehemiah or Esther. So it is little wonder why the Dead Sea Scrolls would be deemed so important to Christian apologists who want to find within them the validation of their own thoughts about scripture, even beyond convictions regarding its reliability and historicity. But this brings us to another highly significant aspect of the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls that many apologists are more reluctant to talk about. And that is how the scrolls have informed and reshaped our own perspectives of textual traditions which lie behind the Bible. But that's for the next video, where we'll take a much closer look at the two Isaiah scrolls that in 1947 were at first discovered in Qumran Cave 1. I'm Kip Davis. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this first video in my comprehensive series on the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you do not want to wait for weeks for the release of this second one, then you can watch right now on my Patreon at the link in the description below. For as little as $4 a month, you can have exclusive early access to all the videos in this series, and any future videos as I make them. So go ahead and join today, and thank you for your support.